September 1960, to the United Nations come presidents and tribal chieftains, kings and dictators. Yet of them all, one man dominates the conclave, Nikita Khrushchev. Primed by two recent Cold War propaganda victories, he arrives with ambitious plans for destroying UN influence in world affairs. But this time, he will not get his way. In the General Assembly, a defeated Khrushchev stages a crude performance which shocks the world. Khrushchev wins new headlines with his public courtship of Fidel Castro. Even with an American presidential campaign in progress, he remains a Pied Piper to reporters. Uh, like the deal with a Roman Catholic in the White House. I run for the presidency of the United States because it is the center of action. And in a free society, the chief responsibility of the president is to set before the American people the unfinished public business of our country. The world does not sit still. The balance of power does not hang. It moves in one direction or the other like the tide. And I want to make sure in the 1960s that the tide moves in our favor. In January of 1961, power has a frightening measure, megatons. And with this power, an impetuous dictator dedicated to conquest will challenge this untried president sworn to peace. So help me God. In the summer of 1961, a crucial meeting takes place in Vienna. Forgoing the shelter of diplomatic channels, two world leaders have come to take each other's measure. Both welcome the test. Nikita Khrushchev has played this game before, with statesmen far more experienced than John Kennedy, elected just eight months ago. To make this encounter meaningful, Kennedy must somehow turn Khrushchev's disdain into respect. They move past polite exchanges to pursue radically different goals. Khrushchev bluntly threatens to take action in Berlin in defiance of established American rights. Kennedy warns that this could lead to open conflict. This is not a negotiating session. It is a dueling ground. At an elegant state dinner, the bristling give and take between the world's two most powerful men is suspended. On this night, each serves as escort for the other's wife and leads one reporter to call it history's strangest double date. by official smiles, the debate nears its end. Kennedy makes a last desperate attempt to shake the unyielding Khrushchev from a dangerous course of action. He does not succeed. At the end of the conference, some of the fury boils to the surface as Kennedy warns Khrushchev, it's going to be a cold winter. Kennedy came to Vienna filled with hope. He leaves with a sobering truth. Khrushchev does not listen to reason. Ahead is the prospect of a challenge to American rights in Berlin. In time, he will recognize that Berlin was merely the setting for Khrushchev's Cold War explorations, that it was more a bluff than a crisis.
Khrushchev now feels that he controls the timetable of world events. And his schedule calls for something more than exploration. He is preparing for the acid test in the Cold War. In the fortress of the new frontier, the atmosphere has changed. By taking a hard line, Kennedy has checked Khrushchev's drive. The victory in Berlin, coming as it does just months after the utter failure at Cuba's Bay of Pigs, has given renewed confidence to the Kennedy administration. For eight months, there is a lull. Now in the fall of 1962, comes the first hint of crisis. Kennedy summons his top echelon, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, and key advisors like Defense Chief Robert McNamara. The government is concerned over a mysterious report by responsible men that there are Soviet offensive missiles in Cuba. spy plane, already linked with turning points in the Cold War, is sent over Cuba in search of the truth. Khrushchev has vigorously denied planting long-range rockets in Cuba, but the fear remains. Ninety miles away, there may be a nuclear arsenal threatening virtually every American city with instant annihilation. Days of surveillance produce pictures of extraordinary construction activity in remote areas of Cuba. Despite attempts at camouflage, to experts, they are unmistakably missile sites. The news makes its way through the chain of command. It will be examined and checked at every step. Almost 24 hours pass before the news reaches the White House. Days ago, Kennedy had denied the existence of offensive missiles in Cuba. If he is shocked now, it is not apparent. Within minutes, he is working on the crisis, which for the moment must remain secret. The masquerade begins. As scheduled, there is a White House reception for astronaut Walter Schirra and his family. Kennedy's banner must be casual. He must seem relaxed, unhurried. A meeting arranged by hushed early morning phone calls will begin in one hour. Even at this moment, the most important men in government are on their way to the White House. The United States is facing the possibility of war. With carefully selected officials, a group which will become known as XCOM, Kennedy considers alternatives. One, do nothing. Two, a naval blockade of Cuba. Three, bomb the missile sites. Four, invade the island. The overriding danger is escalation, a deadly sequence of action that could turn crisis into war. The president is determined to act, but he has not decided how and when. Never have the insistent demands made on his time been as frustrating. Kennedy cannot cancel any previously made appointments. However, one item on his calendar takes on new importance, a meeting with Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko. For two hours they talk, the president carefully guarding his comments. Berlin is their main topic. Well into the session, Kennedy makes an offhand reference to Cuba, and he listens politely as Gromyko once more assures him there are no offensive weapons in Cuba. On this night at the State Department, where Gromyko will meet with Dean Rusk, the Soviet foreign minister seems friendly and cooperative to reporters. One of them, the German peace settlement, I think that exchange of views, exchange of opinion between the president and myself is useful. Mr. Minister, was anything said about the armament? 
Nine other men are meeting at the State Department tonight. All but one of their limousines have been hidden from view so as not to attract attention. XCOM continues its crisis planning on the seventh floor while Gromyko chats with Rusk on the eighth. Time is running out. By design, the president has had his committee meet without him to encourage a free exchange of ideas. But he is approaching the point where the talk must stop and the action begin. president wants to do at this moment is to take part in a political campaign. But this appearance was promised in days when the campaign seemed certain to be October's only source of excitement. So Kennedy finds himself in Cleveland, where he must deliver a speech on behalf of local candidates. It has to be done was done in the 30s or the 40s or the 50s, and that it's our job in the 1960s to sit still. I don't believe it at all. There is no question but that the right decision in 1962, and as it was, if I may say so, the right decision is democratic. Thank you. Behind the speaker stand, a special telephone has been installed, should Washington urgently want to contact him. In Washington, a silent mansion, an empty room, to note peace. But the president is in Chicago, awaiting word from his war council. XCOM has virtually completed plans for the invasion of Cuba, plans for the airstrike, and plans for a blockade at sea. The key discussions are ending. All points of view have been aired and argued over. The government is fully prepared to carry out any course of action. The committee's job is done. It is time for decision. has been forced to cancel the remainder of this week's political schedule uh, due to a mild upper respiratory infection. Though he rarely is seen in a raincoat and never wears a hat, he dons both as part of a story concocted to cover his sudden departure. The air salinger is left to tell the necessary lie. Dr. George Berkeley, the assistant White House physician, uh, first noticed that the president had a husky voice last night. He examined the president this morning and found that he had a one degree of temperature and advised the president, view of the fact that most of today's activities were out of doors, uh, to cancel his schedule and return to Washington. The president has returned to Washington. A new examination by Dr. Berkeley has showed that the temperature has somewhat subsided, but the president plans to remain in his quarters throughout the day. Saturday, October 20th, four days since the president received the first word of missile-based construction in Cuba. XCOM's frequent hurried meetings attract the attention of reporters. By necessity, the secret is shared with experts, and the lid is coming loose here, while intelligence reports show frightening progress in Cuba. From this Saturday until the president is ready to launch American action, he will not be seen in public. To explain the long hours and the air of tension, like most XCOM members, Kennedy has sketched the crisis for his wife. Kennedy withholds the final order to allow himself 24 hours in which to review what he has already reviewed. To do nothing is unthinkable, and a bombing attack or actual invasion of Cuba invites immediate Soviet retaliation, which could easily escalate to world disaster. From the briefings, discussions, and facts, the judgment is made, molded by conscience, shaped by a hard and dispassionate intellect. He gives the order to blockade Cuba.
Pierre Salinger now breaks the official silence. He tells reporters the president has requested television time Monday night for an important speech. It is Monday, October 22nd. The word is going out along Washington's diplomatic row. Advanced copies of Kennedy's speech are being delivered to every embassy. At the State Department, late in the afternoon, Ambassador Dobrynin leaves the office of Dean Rusk, silent, sullen, angry. He has just been given the news. At this moment, 25 Soviet ships, some carrying missiles, are steaming towards Cuba. They are destined to play a key role in the crisis, for tonight, President Kennedy will make these freighters the focal point of world attention as he reveals their mission and draws the line they must not cross. This sudden, clandestine decision to station strategic weapons for the first time outside of Soviet soil is a deliberately provocative and unjustified change in the status quo, which cannot be accepted by this country. All ships of any kind bound to Cuba from whatever nation or port, will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. The freighters continue to move towards Cuba. American warships will soon have firm orders to sink those ships carrying offensive weapons if they will not turn back. The president's speech has activated plans that affect not only the families of reservists ordered to active duty, the military dependents being airlifted out of the U.S. base at Cuba's Guantanamo Bay, but the security and even the lives of all Americans. Yet, of more than 50,000 telegrams that come in, the ratio in favor of the president's action is an amazing 10 to 1. Khrushchev's first reply to the blockade is a long, angry statement. He has been caught off guard, so he desperately plays for time. As American jets and squadron force are moved into Homestead Air Force Base in Florida, a division of troops from Kansas starts for Georgia. As they await action, the men and machinery of war run deadly practice missions. The organization of American states is called into emergency session. Kennedy is anxious to gain diplomatic endorsement of his action. But even optimists at the State Department are overwhelmed by the unanimous support of a 19 to nothing vote. Phone messages overtax White House facilities. An extra communications van is pressed into use. If Washington is to be evacuated, those who will accompany the president will be alerted from this van. Low-level Navy reconnaissance planes maintain a constant vigil over Cuba. Round-the-clock processing of their film shows that work on the missile sites is being accelerated. In the face of this evidence, Khrushchev still refuses to admit the existence of the missile bases. This stand forces Russia into a ludicrous position at the United Nations. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? Ha, 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 ha. 
Я не нахожусь в американском суде, и поэтому не, не хочу отвечать на вопрос, который задается в прокурорском плане. The first break comes. Twelve Russian ships, believed to be carrying missiles, turn away before entering the blockade area. Says Dean Rusk, we are eyeball to eyeball, and I think the other fellow just blinked. But Kennedy can take no satisfaction in this small victory. The Russian missiles already in Cuba will soon be operational. Kennedy cannot predict Khrushchev's actions. Two letters have come from the Kremlin. The first promised a peaceful solution. The second offered an unacceptable trade the Cuban missile sites for the NATO bases in Turkey. Kennedy has answered the first and ignored the second. But if Khrushchev continues to stall, additional military action will be needed. At Strategic Air Command headquarters in Omaha, the alert has reached the status, one step short of war. Around the clock, these monitors of the world are carefully watched, presumably a similar group of experts lays screens inside Russia. One series of orders, and the unimaginable becomes reality. A grim precaution is contained in this plane. Should the Soviet Union attack and destroy all land-based SAC installations, the counterattack order will come from this jet, a flying command post airborne 24 hours a day. The long, anxious wait continues, but Kennedy knows the crisis has reached the bend in the road. Late on the night of October 27th, he says, it can go either way. The communications center of the State Department has become the center of hope, for it is from here that Khrushchev has received his warnings, and it is here that his final answer will first be known. Sunday, October 28th, word comes from Moscow. Khrushchev has ordered the missiles returned to Russia. The crisis is over. The business of government returns to normal. For John F. Kennedy, new projects beckon. In three days, the president will again be out helping Democratic congressional candidates. In the off-year election, one of his first stops will be Boston, where he will lend support to a Senate candidate named Edward Kennedy. The Cuban Missile Crisis marked a major high point in John Kennedy's short time as president. He secured victory from the brink of disaster. President Kennedy had written, Courage is an opportunity that sooner or later is presented to us all. When it was presented to him, he was ready. The Cuban Missile Crisis has produced a positive result. Kennedy and Khrushchev both came to realize the need for faster communications between the world's two great powers. A hotline was installed in July 1963 a direct link between Moscow and Washington. In time of future crisis, there will at least be this.